Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're going to talk about Kaka'ako. Uh, we call the series Catching Up on Kaka'ako because, in fact, over the years, uh, Think Tech has done so many shows about Kaka'ako from like 20 years. And so we're really happy to be able to talk about it uh, with the executive director of the HCDA, the Hawaii Community Development Authority. We're talking about planning considerations for Kaka'ako. And we're we're going to ask the uh, we're going to ask the uh, executive director what's going on and what it's like over there. Uh, right after this one moment. Great to have you on the show, Craig. Uh, Craig Nakamoto. It's it's wonderful to be able to revisit with you. Um, tell us a little about the Hawaii Community Development Authority and tell us why you're doing it and what kind of gratification you get out of that. <laughs> Thanks, Jay, for uh, having me on. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Kaka'ako and especially about Kaka'ako Makai. You know, uh, Hawaii Community Development Authority uh, has a history. Uh, back in 1976, when it was established by the legislature, uh, the words that the uh, enabling statute used were, was, were particularly uh, strong. They use words like uh, the area was underutilized, was deteriorating, and they even said it was blighted. Um, those are strong words to describe an area in, in 1976 that was really in the urban Honolulu core, but it was blighted, deteriorated, and underdeveloped, underutilized. Their aspiration. Let me, let me add that, that, that in fact, uh, it was a bit of a slum years ago. Uh, that's where people lived in uh, slum-like houses uh, in, in Kakako Mauka. And, um, and then, of course, um, it was garbage dump. And it was a refuse area. And that makes it so interesting because it has, as you say, a really interesting history. Right. And it had the garbage dump. And then, of course, the, you know, my, my uh, in-laws grew up in Kakako. And they remember swimming down by uh, the waterfront. Uh, and hence, uh, it, it used, they used to call it garbage dump. And then, of course, the surf spot down there is called flies for a reason. Uh, so, <laughs> so, I didn't it, know that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so it's an interesting history, to be sure. And, you know, the, asper, the, the vision that the legislature had for Kakako was that, and HCDA, was that all of this community and planning and development would result in a community which serve, and I'm kind of quoting from the statute now, the highest aspirate needs and aspirations of Hawaii's people. The highest, the highest needs and aspirations of Hawaii's people. Again, those are strong words to describe what they envisioned Kakako to become. So so they, we were, know, they saw it as uh, it's been uh, often referred to as the gem of the city uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful, it's green, it's on the water. Uh, it's really a fantastic place. And so, you know, the legislature did that so they could um, handle it on a state level and they could help, you know, design it on a state level. Somebody like you with HCDA, um, they recognized the value of the land and the iconic nature of the land and the, the planning and urban planning possibilities for the land. So, you know, in their, in their moment of creating HCDA, they were, they were wise, I think. Yeah, I, I believe so. And, and, and I, they were also looking at HCDA as the state entity that would really bring together uh, city, state, federal, private interests to develop Kakako. And that's exactly what we've done since 1976 starting with Kakako, and then the legislature added uh, other districts, Kalailoa, Heia, and other, those districts as well. I mean, in the end, in the end, our mantra is, you know, we build communities. We build communities. That's our, that's our mission, and that's our goal. Mm -hmm. And HCDA spent a, a fair amount of time and money back when, after 76, in creating infrastructure. Uh, in creating that park, which I consider one of the most beautiful parks in the state, um, and in um, you know setting it up for for you know proper uses, and so um, you know HCDA has the mission of planning, the mission of uh, assigning those uses, uh, the the mission of 
preserving, protecting, and allowing this, uh, arranging for it to be developed in such a way so that it has a uh, moment in, in the city. And uh, while downtown has a certain role and function, uh, Kaka'ako has a different role and function. It is unique, is it not? Because it's not just development. We're a redevelopment agency, but we're, uh, we're looking at planned development for our, our, our communities like Kaka'ako. It's planned development that takes into account what the community needs, the community in, input, and trying to serve, you know, meet the, the highest needs and aspirations of the people of the state of Hawaii. Yeah, well, I spent many hours at that park. I used to go there on a regular basis, uh, and I enjoyed it very much. And it does, uh, you know, as a park, it really, it, uh, it's magnetic to me. I, 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 I think it's beautiful. Uh, the, the scenes, uh, um, the views of the uh, shoreline and the city and, and the green grass all around. But, you know, um, what were some of the previous planning efforts for Kakako Makai? Because, um, you know, planning is uh, like your middle name. Um, but uh, <laughs> I know it's not the middle name between Craig and Nakamoto, but it's, <laughs> it is the middle name of HCDA. So tell us about the you know, the planning aspirations uh, around Kaka'ako, especially Kaka'ako Makai, over the years. Yeah, the, the planning efforts for Kaka'ako Makai is, is uh, definitely an interesting history. Um, as, as you probably know, Kaka'ako Makai was added to our community development district after the Malka area was added and was created in 1976. So this was in 1982. Um, in 1985, uh, we had, uh, you know, created a master plan for Makai, and it included residential development at that time. In the in the and you know, planning is a is not a static static process; it's an evolving process. So in 1990, uh, the the next revision of the, the master plan eliminated um, residential. And then in 2005, when we created the last latest version of the uh, Makai area plan, residential was added back again. And then in 2005, the sort of the uh, sort of the catalytic event that uh, started a lot of the subsequent changes and um, developments in Kakako Makai was the uh, proposal to build a residential condominium in Kakako Makai, the so-called Alexander and Baldwin project. Yeah, I remember that so well because that was the early days for uh, Think Tech, and we were doing radio at the time. And um, uh, Alexander Baldwin was going to build multiple towers there. Things mixed between fee and uh, leasehold. They were very tall towers. Uh, uh, Linda Lingle and Ted Liu were behind it at the time, and uh, there was a lot of opposition uh, from SOS, the Save Our Surfers group, <clears throat> Save Our Surf, and uh, and the community in general. And it really showed you how people felt about residential development in Kaka'ako Makai. So one day, Craig, I get a call from Stan Kuriyama, who was the, <laughs> the CEO of Alexander Ball, which was a national big board company, you know. And uh, there he was uh, on the phone with me. He says, Jay, he says, I want to come down to Think Tech. I have an announcement to make. I want to give you a scoop, he said. <clears throat> so, okay, all right. You're Stan Kuriyama. You can come down. And he came down <laughs> that very afternoon at 5 p.m. right there. I forget the exact month, but and he said, Jay, I want to tell you that Alexander Baldwin after considering the views of the community and all the planning considerations, we are not going to build that project. We are terminating that project. I want everybody to know. Wow, what a guy. What a company. I was so pleased and proud that they were sensitive to community sensibilities like that. And it was, um, it was not you know, just opposition. It was significant community opposition mm -hmm. to that uh, Alexander and Baldwin plan and proposal that really started 
um, the grassroots community input and meetings that followed that with the uh, CPAC group. And then 2006 was another watershed year. That's when the legislature, after actually passing several resolutions uh, about residential development in Makai, passed the law that prohibited residential development in all of Kakaako Makai. But you know the the planning efforts for CPAC and that group was a five year, almost a five year effort. Uh, Forty over forty public meetings, consultations, studies, uh, analysis, uh, and workshops that that really, I mean, the community voices were heard loud and clear. Yeah, you bet. And so, uh, what does CPAC stand for? The uh, Kakako Community Planning Advisory Council. This is very important because it was the, the grassroots and um, very important to hear from them. Very important that, um, you know, that the powers that be were sensitive, as A and B was, um, to the voices of the public. And what were the considerations? Can you tell us what the considerations were for the passage of that, that bill uh, that uh, pro prohibited residential development in Mackay? Well, I, I, I think um, the voice of the community looked at, viewed Kakako Makai as being a place for the people, a place where people could surf, fish, access the ocean, access the parks, and recreate there. And uh, it, of course, it was uh, some of that group was Save Our Surf, as you mentioned, but the Friends of Kiwalo, um, you know, were active in um, you know, that in CPAC. But I think it was it was that notion and that idea that uh, Kakako Kai was a, really a place for the people. It was a place where uh, access to fishing, uh, ocean sports, the park was very important. The park, as you mentioned, the, the waterfront park. Yeah, uh, very important. So, um, okay, since then, lots has happened in the sense that um, OHA um, um, made some kind of deal. I don't know if we know all the terms, um, you know, the, the discussions, but uh, some kind of deal with uh, Neil Abercrombie um, in the last years. Well, he didn't serve that long, but in the, in the course of his administration, uh, where... Uh, uh, debts due to OHA from the, the state from ceded lands uh, were traded for that land. Can you talk about that? Uh, you know, I, I wasn't at HCDA. And, yeah, I think when the land transfer occurred, uh, it was in 2012. So I wasn't at OHA, I mean at uh, HCDA. But um, you're right, it was a settlement of the past debts owed to OHA by the state for ceded lands. And it involved um, parcels in Kakako Makai. Um, the OHA got this in consideration for um, you know the past debts owed to OHA by the state. The you know the general terms of this land transfer and conveyance was that uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, was taking the taking or accepting the parcels sort of as is where is. is not uncommon in um, you know land transfers mm -hmm. and they were taking the pro uh, properties uh, subject to subject to the zoning laws conditions of the Hawaii Community Development Authority yeah Hawaii. and that statute you mentioned they took it subject to that statute that said you cannot build residential in Kakako Makai right yeah, correct, because the, the statute was, as I mentioned, it, um, enacted in uh, 2006, and the land transfer occurred in 2012. Mm -hmm. So it, it, they were taking the property subject to the statute, and specifically the settlement uh, said that they were taking it subject to the, the zoning rules and laws and conditions of HCDA. So, um... But uh, OHA didn't do anything with that land for several years. And now we find that in the state legislature, there's uh, some bills that would attempt to repeal 
the statute from what 2005 or six uh, re re uh, restricting uh, private residence construction there. Can you talk about that? Sure. I, I think from 2012, um, OHA has done you know uh, some things with you know, put some use to their properties in Makai, but I, I don't think anything significant. Um, I believe that their plans for Kakaako Makai are a lot more significant. They've undergone, I believe, a planning effort. Um, I, I was invited to one of their community uh, meetings that, were, that was put on by their consultant. Uh, so they do plan to, there's several bills at the currently in the legislature that would repeal the residential restriction on either a few of their parcels or or more of their parcels. Hmm. But um, what what do they hope to do with this land? Uh, what, why uh, are they putting these bills in? What do they hope to achieve? Well, I I I, I don't know what um, what their sort of ex specific plan is, but I think what they hope to achieve. Uh, with the with the the proposal to repeal the residential ban is probably build residential condominiums hmm. and big ones too, right? I mean, they they also have a bill uh, uh, increasing the height limit of any condo in the area to. Um, have I got this right? Four hundred feet. Four hundred feet, and and I think you know, Jay, on on the on the residential issue, you know, as as I've mentioned, I mean, you know, the the you know the will of the community has spoken. Um, you know, right now the law is that residential development is prohibited in the Makai area. That is the law, and that is what ACDA will follow until that law is repealed. And and there's no am I right? There's no plan that would permit this kind of uh, construction condominium use uh, in Kaka'ako Makai. There is no plan approved by HCDA or any agency that would permit that, right? We have not, we have, since 2006, we have not reviewed or approved any uh, plan for residential development in, in Kaka'ako Makai. And as long as that law is still valid, in effect, we will not approve any residential review or of any residential development in Kaka'akumakai. So um, I don't know if you see you say this stuff this way, but I do. I see you as the steward of this land. I mean, I, I think that's probably, uh, you know, an apt term for HCDA and for you. Uh, as the steward of the land, uh, can you tell us uh, about, you know, what this land is like right now? We know that years ago it was, uh, it was, it was rubbish. Uh, we know that it's on the shoreline. Uh, we know from from the science and uh, all the people at the university and so west that there will be climate change changes uh, in the shoreline. Sea, uh, uh, sea sea level rise for sure coming soon. In the we've already seen indications of that. So what is this land like? And is um, is a, a, a forty story condo an appropriate use? For the land as you embrace it? So, you know, Jay, um, we are a redevelopment agency that's charged with plan development. When you have a plan development, um, plan development require planning, research, study. To, to arrive at the, at the 2005 Mau uh, Makai area plan and, and rules required a lot of resources, time to study, study them, to come up with the current height limits, the current density in Makai. It, it, it was studied and that's how it was determined. Now, to now suggest that the density or the height limits should be changed from 200 to 400, um, I believe it's not something that should be uh, changed or, or uh, uh, changed by the legislature. 
this is should be a planning uh, planning uh, review that takes into account can the area support this? Is there enough sewer infrastructure, electrical, electrical water? Uh, what is and and any developer, Jay, whether it's OHA or someone they choose, is going to have to take a look and have to consider the condition of the soil as it relates to the foundation. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, much of the Kakaako Makai area is a result of landfill from um, the, the incinerator that uh, that what, what was a former um, children's museum. There was, you know, the former building. So it's going to have to take into account all of that. Also, the realities of sea level rise and how it's going to impact development in Makai and, and other areas that are affected by sea level rise are going to have to be taken into account by any developer, not just, not just oil, but any developer that's subject to sea level rise. What about the, you talked about the soil. Um, the soil is a result of landfill and, um, you know, even a casual walk uh, around the park shows you these methane relief pipes. Uh, which suggests there's something toxic in that soil. Um, uh, what, what do we know about that, and how would that affect any development? How would it affect? How would it would it affect the plan, uh, whatever planning is done? I think any any developer will have to look at the environmental environmental a, uh, aspect of any development. What's what's underneath the you know the surface of the uh, the underneath the surface and um, decide what kind of remediation efforts. Yeah. Well, I mean, and all of these factors actually affect not only Kaka'ako Makai, but they affect the water table uh, as, it, as, it, as it goes up into Kaka'ako Mauka and all those other projects up there. So, that, you know, this is, a, this is a planning process that would have to look at the whole comprehensive and see, you know, whatever is contemplated for Kaka'ako Makai um, has a connection. It's a, it's a community that's bigger than just the immediate community that is under consideration. Am I right? Just looking at, um, just looking at the, um, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, proposal to increase building heights to certain height, height limits to 400 feet, under the 2005 Makai area plan and rules, uh, the planners at that time contemplated, uh, you know, at the at the shoreline of Makai, like a 45 to 65 foot height limit. They kind of transitioned into a 100 foot height limit or surrounding the parks, and then transition into 200 feet near Ala Moana Boulevard, and then. Um, across uh, this Alamona Boulevard, 400 feet. It, I believe that the vision that the planners had at that time and the urban form they were trying to create was one where it, it kind of a stepped up kind of view where at the ocean, at the waterfront, it was a lower building heights that kind of stepped up and peered into, um, you know, 400 feet across the way. It, it's the, the consideration of 400 feet, Jay, is not a question of equity or parity between Mauka and Makai. It's more of a question of planning and the planning process that needs to go into establishing 400 feet versus 200 feet. It, it requires planning, it requires study, analysis, and more importantly, more importantly, as um, the history of Kakako Makai shows a lot of community engagement. What does a community want to see an additional 200 feet on, on these buildings? So when you use word, when you use the word like 200 feet versus or 200 versus 400 feet, what does it really mean? What does it really mean? What it means is in buildings that are created, you're going to have a lot more use. You're going to have people. Uh, if residential is 
is is uh, allowed, you're going to have people in there. That's a lot more people, a lot more activity in those in the, in those uh, buildings. And can can Kakako Makai in the infrastructure uh, handle that? What are the traffic impacts? The traffic impacts of that uh, of that kind of uh, um, increased height and and density. Those all yeah. have to be studied. Yeah, and there are all kinds of um, you know, oceanic and scientific issues here. We talked to one um, expert, and he said, "Well, in, in Mackay, uh, you run the risk of, of having uh, big waves, king size waves, and even tsunamis. And so you have to build any building with room uh, for that water to flow under the building." And and that leads to the question of what kind of uh, special specifications should be assigned to building permits. Um, you know, this is not an ordinary building because of the uh, extraordinary uh, physical characteristics of the area. And that means money, um, costly modifications <clears throat> to the ordinary specifications for, for building permits. Um, and then, of course, that means that the project is more expensive, and the result is the units, uh, if there are units, are also more expensive. And and the, what we are talking about, Craig, I think, is it sounds to me like not only community meetings, such as took place you know, 20 years ago, but also uh, a whole EIS project. And my understanding is that this is state land. What you preside over is state land. And OHA is a state agency. And so there's no question at all that the state requirements for an EIS I mean, a significant ERS, EIS with a lot of issues, meetings, uh, experts, you know, and, and, and analytics uh, uh, have to be conducted. Am I right? I think you're right, Jay. I, and, you know, if we're going to, if HCD is going to look at uh, 400 feet versus 200 feet, a density of, you know, six versus, you know, 2.5, um, we're going to, we're looking at, a possible rule amendment and with that possible rule amendment i believe that we're we will have to uh undergo another environmental assessment as will oha because they're a state agency and um and, and maybe using state funds as well so those are both triggers for uh possible eis yeah what's uh what's ironic is that uh the eis uh that my knowledge, my understanding is that there has not been an EIS, and they would have to be an EIS. It's not a matter of updating an old one. It's a matter of starting fresh with all of these various considerations and special characteristics. And it's not dissimilar from positions that OHA has taken in the past for other properties where it has required uh, an EIS, perhaps with the notion of trying to stop a project. And now the tables are turned, no? Yeah, I, I, I think for for HC from HCDA's perspective, I mean OHA is is likely to have to do an EIS for whatever project they decide to do. On our part, on HCDA's part, I we I think we've already done an environmental assessment on Makai, and so if we're going to change the rules to a, to allow 400 feet and increase density. I believe we're going to have to update or supplement our, you know, environmental assessment that we did or EIS. Mm -hmm. I, I and, and I want to note, Jay, that um, I want to note that um, I'm I understand uh, where uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is right now and and their desire to, um, you know, create revenues to support their beneficiaries. I do. Um, I I believe that if their if their vision in uses that are not residential right now, not residential, like a cultural place, a cultural place, a commercial or retail sh shops, um, shops that are maybe open to local businesses. Um, they can develop that right now. They can develop that right now. 
Well, you know, that goes to um, the views of people, ordinary people who like to walk their dogs through the park, um, like me. And, um, you know, I see um, Takako Makai as a green field, a park, a place to come and enjoy the, uh, you know, the outdoors, the elements, have a picnic with my family, um, not be obstructed from seeing the ocean, not being obstructed from seeing the mountains, you know, um, a very special place. And that's really important considering that it's downtown, near downtown. Um, and it's a, a, a very, you know, uh, it's, it's what, what did I say before? It's, it's the gem uh, of, of the whole area. So aside from all the other planning considerations, the technical, environmental, you know, EIS construction uh, issues, it seems to me that uh, part of this conversation is a conversation about, about um, allowing people to relate to nature. Uh, do we need more shops? Do we need more high rises in the center of the city? Uh, the answer for me and a lot of other people would be no. What's your sense of that? What's your sense of the community view of this? I, I think that at least the community view of Mackay is uh, sort of well established in the in the years of community planning and engagement that has already taken place. Which is not to say that the community view, you know, may, may uh, is still the same, but I I believe the community vision for Mackay is reflected in the Kakako Mike Mackay conceptual master plan that was developed by the CPAC working group. Uh, that was the culmination of their work. And um, I also believe, Jay, that like you, I think the vision of Kakako Makai with a lower sort of height limit at the ocean, stepping up to a little bit higher at Almana Boulevard is what is described, or that's the vision of the 2005 Makai area plan right now. Yeah, well, that's that. Yeah, I think I agree with you about how people feel, everybody I know uh, feels that way. One of the, one of the points I'd like to uh, ask you about, and you said that this, this according to OHA, would enable OHA to raise the money um, and for the benefit of its beneficiaries. But what you didn't say is that this would allow OHA to provide housing for Native Hawaiian people. Uh, it, and it doesn't seem from what I know that it would. It would, it would provide funds because, you know, anybody who, uh, brings in a developer, builds a, a big building, 20 stories, 40 stories, uh, walks away with a big check, and uh, the actual units are not owned by, uh, by either that organization or its beneficiaries. Uh, its own, those units are owned by people from far away because they would involve uh, huge prices, especially for units along the water. Uh, am I right to, to see it that way? That it, it really would not, it would not. Uh, help afford Native Hawaiians with affordable housing so much as provide OHA with funding, which they would um, uh, use uh, to help Native Hawaiians in other ways. No? You know, Jay, I, I, you know, since OHA's planning efforts have begun, were started, I, I really tried to focus on what is HCDA's role you know, in any kind of um, development by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, like any major landowner in um, in the Kakako district. Um, I really spent less time focusing on, you know, how many, you know, what kind of residential units they want to build or, or produce, whether it's going to be uh, how many market units uh, or, or affordable units or whether they're going to, you know, uh, have some set aside for Native Hawaiians. I really kind of, you know, not focus that much on it because I, there's, I understand. Enough, there's enough to focus on. Um, you know, in in um, earlier this year, um, I invited uh, the Office of Wine Affairs to present um, to our board, our Kakako board, uh, to just for information to let the board inform the board on what their plans were. Um, and after considering it, they decided not to, uh, you know, not to uh, present at the board. So 
I'm, I'm not sure what, you know, what exactly they have in, in mind in their plans. Mm, okay. So um, the environmental analyses uh, that would have to be done here um, to clear this uh, legally and in terms of urban planning, um, the HCDA would be involved, wouldn't it? Uh, you, you would you would be uh, organizing at least parts of it. You would be present. Uh, you would ha- you would have a I suppose a stay, or you would you would hear people who have a stay. What would your role be in the in the, this in, environmental analysis? Yeah, I think I think um, you know envi- an environmental um, assessment or EIS is is uh, sort of a disclosure document at its at its very base. It's going to disclose um, the various environmental impacts. It's going to uh, allow public input and discourse into what the impacts are, and people are going to be allowed to comment on it through a public comment period. Uh, if if the Hawaii Community Development Authority is going to amend its own rules, you know we will uh, definitely be involved in that, and we, if we have to do a environmental impact statement, we will be involved in that. I'm going to I'm going to assume that if OHA is going to develop um, their land, that they're going to be involved, they're going to have to do a assessment as well. And I think we'll have a say in it uh, as as a stakeholder in the in the community. Yeah, one of the things I always uh, always uh, I wonder about it is that this is not city land. Um, and I wonder what the role of OHA or sorry, what the role of HV, um, ACDA as opposed uh, HCDA as opposed to the Department of Planning and Permitting is in terms of um, setting you know, standards for construction for the issuance of building permits on, on new construction uh, as opposed to construction elsewhere in the city. In other words, is, is HCDA you know, the organization that would, that would make those rules or is it DPP at the city or is it both? So, um, because of uh, HCDA's, um, because the legislature established the Hawaii Community Development Authority, we are the zoning and land use uh, agency for Kakako. So, before any development occurs in Kakako, Makai, um, you know, whether it's by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs or another landowner, they would have to. Uh, come to HCDA, and um, we would have to review a development permit for that. And so the project would have to be aligned with uh, and be consistent with our land use uh, land use um, you know rules. City's yeah, role, the, the city's role in it would be uh, DPP would approve a you know a building permit after plans are submitted. Um, as it, as they do with every construction project in in Kakako. Hmm. So it's both. Oh, it's both. Hmm. That, that that's interesting. That might take a while. Get that all straightened out. Um, and and here's the question I would ask you. You know, let's assume that takes a while. Let's assume that the EIS EIS takes a while. That any changes in and um, you know in the specifications for building permits. You know, for example, to um, to uh, uh, account for the special characteristics of the land and the special implications of any construction on Mackay. So let's assume that <laughs> takes years. What happens in the interim? Big question, Craig. Um, what What's your view? What's your vision? What's your you know path, so to speak, in the interim? So. Uh, let me go back to you know one thing you mentioned. I think you know this. Uh, uh, I didn't want to uh, make you think that this you know sort of HCDA uh, and our land use authority and zoning authority versus the city DPP is something new. It, this is this is a established practice. I mean, not practice, but this is the process that is used for every development. We 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 approve a development for land use zoning, and then. The developer has has to go into the city DPP to approve a building permit. Um, in in the interim, while while this um, while the while if if environmental assessment and reviews are necessary, 
um, I, I think um, you know we we would would just be the sort of the status quo. I mean, we we the the, the whatever land use or laws, uh, you know, and and rules are in effect for HCDA. That's what we would follow. And in the absence of um, you know appropriate proceedings and permits, how, how would you like to see in your mind's eye? I remember Dan Janelle. Remember him? He was your predecessor a couple of executives ago. He and you were in um, uh, 677 Alamoana, and he looked out the window, and he stood next to Ed Cadman, uh, who was the dean of the uh, uh, John A. Burns School of Medicine and all, and the founder of it. And they looked out the window together, and they had a vision of how Kaka'ako, particularly Kaka'ako Makai, was going to was going to be in the future, and they they were able to describe their vision. Their vision was to keep it a green grass thing, except um, uh, Ed Cadman wanted to have big pharma in the medical school, and that would have changed the construction of the medical school. Um, but but query, how do you see it? If you look out your window, <laughs> how, how do you see in your mind's eye uh, the optimal the optimal condition of this this land? Yeah, you know, I I I I still see it, uh, Makai as a a place where it kind of a gathering place where uh, people can come and you know uh, recreate in the parks, walk around. I I think there's more um, you know development that needs to occur in Makai, honestly, um, you know, to um, from what it is now. Um, I also believe that um, you know any kind of any development, if if uh, OHA uh, wants to develop, uh, you know we're open to engaging in that dialogue with them, that that and consult with them, like we do with many other landowners in, in Kakako. Yeah, that's interesting. Though um, we've been talking um, about. Um... Uh, Oha, but in fact, there are other landowners uh, in Kaka'ako Makai, and uh, if you know if they manage to um, get some project authorized, despite all these hurdles they're going to have to go through, that means that other landowners, fair as fair, uh, would want to do the same and and would be able to do the same theoretically. And so now it's not just one landowner it's not just one project it's more than that um where, where does it stop well and 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 you know there 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 are a lot of examples of um you know development in 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 makai there's you know there's the there's jabsum there's a cancer research center uh i think we've also envisioned it as a sort of a technology center you know, the sandbox, the entrepreneur sandbox is a good example of a collaboration between HCDA and a developer to build that entrepreneur sand, a sandbox. So I think there's a lot of, besides the park and uh, gathering place, there's technology that's possible uh, in Kakako Makai. That's how I would, if I was looking out my window at 677 Alamoana, I would look at it that way. Are there any... 40-story condos in your vision? Uh, residential? Yeah. Not right now. Not while the law is in place. <laughs> okay. I, as I told you, uh, you know, as long as the residential, as long as the law is in place, we're obliged to follow it. Amen. All right. Thank you, Craig. Craig Nakamoto, the Executive Director of Hawaii Community Development Authority, uh, which covers Kaka'ako Mauka, and especially these days, Kaka Ako Makai. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, Jay. Nice talking to you. The same. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.